I've been studying Japanese since the beginning of the year off and on, but for the last three months I've been studying it very seriously. I wanted to share with you my unique routine as well as establish this format for which I will be journaling my progress with the language. Every morning I start my routine with the Duolingo app. Now before you say anything, I know that Duolingo kind of has a weird reputation. I know it's a meme. I kind of want to do a whole video on Duolingo as a learning tool in another video. I will say in this video, I kind of use it as a tool to remind me to do it and to bug me to do it every day. Um, if I, for some reason, I'm kind of out of routine one morning, it's still gonna bug me for <laughs> the whole day saying, I have hearts, I need to, I need to study all this and eventually I will keep up with my street. I think it's a very good tool in terms of getting your head used to thinking in that language for the day. If I'm not using some sort of tool to warm up and I try and read Japanese straight like off the cuff, I can usually read it. It just takes me a minute to kind of get used to the grammar and the way things are said and how things are pronounced. It just kind of takes me a minute. So I think that's a good tool for that. Usually what I'll do is I'll exhaust all the hearts I have on the mobile app. So I'll go until I run out of hearts, whether that's several lessons or not. Like that can be anywhere from uh, an hour and a half on its own to 30 minutes or whatever. So it's kind of hit or miss depending on how well you do on a certain lesson. Uh, I, I'll try not to get too into it, but there's ways you use it that kind of are more effective than just using it as an app in general. Second, um, I did a lot of research in terms of like what textbooks to use and what's very good for someone who's teaching themselves Japanese. And I, my research kind of put me to these textbooks. I ended up getting the Genki textbooks for multiple reasons. A lot of people swear by certain textbooks and certain things. Like one of them is Mino no Nahongo. It's a very praised series of textbooks because they actually use them in Japanese classrooms. I believe they also use Genki in classrooms as well. Um, people say it's a very good textbook for those that are taking it very seriously. And it's because it's a full immerse. From the get go, they introduce kanji. It's a full, they fully immerse you in the language. Everything is in Japanese in the textbook. It's a good resource if you're trying to learn as fast as possible, as serious as possible, and you're gonna like really take it seriously. I didn't have full confidence in myself for learning that that way. And for a reason, which I'll get to in a minute, I wasn't too worried about the kanji part. I chose the Genki textbook because they, in the beginning, they have the, they have pronunciation underneath hiragana, katakana uh, words. And so it's very good when you're learning, when you're a very beginner at the language, it's a very good way to introduce yourself uh, to how things are pronounced. For those of you learning the language, if you are, be aware that pronunciation at the bottom is not Ramaji. A lot of people are reading it as a Ramaji, which is not accurate. At the beginning, it shows pronunciations underneath each of the words. However, about not even a fourth maybe around a fourth of the way through the textbook or a little bit before that they start weaning you completely off of it they kind of assume at this point you can read the hiragana and katakana and if you cannot <laughs> then you need to review a little bit more um but it's very cool because i still wanted the full immersion i did want to be fully immersed in the language and be forced to read the hiragana and katakana but i also kind of didn't have full confidence in myself in something so serious as the Mina no Nihongo textbooks and so I chose a kind of in between a little bit more of a beginner friendly book. I recommend if you are going to get these books get the accompanying workbook with them. The workbook by itself doesn't have enough doesn't have enough context for you to fill out the workbook by itself sadly but if you have them both together it's a very good learning tool and they have a lot of flashcards online you can use to uh, drill vocabulary. Now the third resource I use um, and it's the third thing I do in my daily routine is kanji. I do kanji studies and the resource I use is this. It's a very interesting resource I learned about from the Abroad in Japan channel. Introduces a new way of learning kanji than it is what usually is taught in the classroom. It's only really a good resource if you are teaching yourself Japanese because the way they teach it is very abrasive to the style that they use in, in a formal teaching setting. Formal teaching does a lot of drilling. This requires you to kind of start from a beginner, not using that style at all. Um, like way of learning um, but basically it's very interesting because the way they teach you in that book the author is saying that 
When he was learning Japanese, it was very strange for him when he was learning kanji because he found that it's more effective. It kind of revolves around the idea of we learn a language and we learn words when we can associate them with real world or with, with a actual visual or event. When you can apply a actual concept to a word, then you're able to absorb it more effectively. And so the idea in this book is basically he's saying that when you are taking these kanji because kanji is so hard to learn, the reason why it's so hard to learn is because they're basically pictographs instead of just a sound being associated to them. Depending on their reading and their context, they can be read and spoken differently, um, even though it's the same symbol. In that book, the tactic is basically using imaginative memory, which is the term that they coin. You associate the symbols and their primitives, their, their pieces, down to their like very basic forms. And once you associate those little things with an item, a picture, a visual, and then you slowly get to, to the point where when you combine two or three different of these basic symbols together, you have this image of something and that image reminds you of whatever. You're able to understand what the meaning of the word is. It doesn't necessarily teach you what the word, how it's pronounced. His idea is once you know what the words mean, the pronunciation will come e e even easier. Thing. Hopefully that makes sense. Those are the three main things I do. Uh, it kind of can differ depending on the day and how productive I'm being. If I spent a lot of time in the Duolingo app and a lot of time on the first two textbooks and workbooks, or I'm starting to get burnt out, I will just review kanji. Especially because if you introduce too many primitives, too many kanji, uh, it'll be hard to kind of analyze them. So I chunk them. And if I can't recall all of them, I won't introduce new ones until I can remember all the originals. So usually like I'll fill out about half a page or maybe a full page if they're really easy. Every single time I start to go to the kanji part of my lesson, I will go through every single kanji I've written down, make sure I know them, the meanings of them at least. And then if I know all the meanings of them, I will start to add more out of the book. As a cool little side note, it also, told, it also shows you the stroke order of kanji so you know how to write them, which is really neat. Eventually on this series, I'd like to be able to do a whole video speaking only and exclusively in Japanese. But as of right now, my Japanese is very rough. So hopefully in the next episode, maybe a couple episodes from now, I'll be able to do a little bit more speaking of it uh, for practice purposes and kind of documenting. It'll be good for me to check back and go analyze it and be like, wow, here's where I started. This my pronunciation is terrible. My grammar is terrible. And then maybe like 20 episodes later, the difference between those two, like the second episode versus 20 episodes later. If any of you are learning a language, specifically Japanese, I recommend speaking to native speakers. Uh, you can learn as much as you can by yourself. Conversational language is much different than textbook language. A lot of stuff in a textbook will do its best to write it in a conversational Japanese, but however, it's important to learn how to hear, immediately be able to answer the, the call and response. Like that needs to start forming in your brain. It's a different kind of muscle, uh, which is something I will do. There's several programs that you can use to speak with uh, native speakers. I will update you on that when I get to that point. Specifically for Japanese, the cultural significance of words and and conversation and who you're speaking to and, and who you are in relation to who you're speaking to is very important to, to speaking Japanese in general. I recommend speaking to a native speaker instead of exclusively learning through like anime or TV shows. You can do those, just know that that's not how you are going to speak anyways thank you for watching i will consistently do these japanese journals uh throughout this uh crazy time it might not be super consistent i will update when enough progress is being made that i feel like it's necessary to update i also want to do a whole video about duolingo how effective it is and kind of talk about it as a learning tool but once again thank you for watching let me know what you're dedicating your time to during this craziness and uh, I'll see you guys in the next episode. Keep it real.